British history is rich with tales of wealth and power and all that political nonsense. The glamour of our kings and queens, the jewels and furs and charisma, and all those heads being chopped off. But what about the real people who made everything happen? Greg Boer. I'll discover what they ate. It's a bit stodgy. The challenges they faced. Stuff this for a game of soldiers. And how they built Britain. That's straight as a die. I'm going to uncover the extraordinary lives of some of history's ordinary people. Romans. It's quite a weight on the head, I have to say. Oh. Edwardians. Breathe in, madam, breathe in. 1950s. Put the needle on the record. Ooh, really soft brakes, takes ages to stop it. And the Middle Ages. There's the executive model inside the house. Whatever. History from the bottom up. This time, I'm going back nearly 2,000 years to the Great Roman Empire. An empire that stretched all the way from Egypt to Hadrian's Wall and brought people from Europe, Asia and Africa to live here, in gloomy old Britain. A couple of thousand years ago, there was no better way of seeing the world than by joining the Roman army. Although it could be a bit of a lottery. For one young man, let's call him Marcus, this would have meant travelling thousands of miles just so he could do guard duty at a forlorn outpost of the Empire in a distant and uncivilised place called Britannia. This is going to be our Marcus. He came from the other end of the empire in Africa. In search of adventure, he would have taken a boat from his homeland along the Nile sometime around the year 200 AD. Adventure Marcus, you want to join the Roman army? OK. Change your Cairo and take a chariot west across the desert till you see a lot of blokes with spears. Great. What a mug. The Romans had been in North Africa for centuries, and Africans travelled around the empire as soldiers, traders and emperors. But the army didn't take just anybody. To qualify, Marcus had to be solid and strong, alert, straight-necked and broad-chested. But it didn't matter how many fingers he had. Some lads had tried to avoid conscription by chopping a couple off. But the army wasn't having that. So having proved he was a sturdy country lad with eight to ten fingers, Marcus had to swear to obey the emperor and never run away from the army or the enemy. Then he was in. Every morning after a hearty breakfast of a pound of bacon, Marcus worked out with a wooden sword, which sounds rubbish, but it was heavier than a real sword to make him even more big and strong. <laughs> then he was dispatched over 3,000 miles from his homeland to Blighty, Rome's most northerly colony for over 150 years. Now, you might think that being a Roman soldier simply meant getting into well-formed units and then smashing the daylights out of the barbarians. <laughs> But there was actually far more to it than that, as Marcus and his mates would soon discover. For a start, there was the marching. You had to march for up to 24 miles a day, which is certainly a lot more than the 4,587 steps I've taken so far. And if there wasn't a road where they wanted to go, Marcus and his comrades would just have to build one. So how did that work? This is historian Dr Simon Elliott. 
Is it true that there were virtually no roads in England prior to the Romans coming and then they banged in a whole lot of roads, many of which are today's A roads? Absolutely, yeah. If you look at the landscape of Britain today, you look at all the A roads, they're all the lines of Roman roads. You think of Watling Street, which is the line of the A2 and the A5. You think of the A1, which is Ermine Street, and its extension from York going into Scotland, which is Deer Street. These are all Roman roads built by Roman legionaries. They were serious roads with drainage and layered with rocks, gravel and sand. The luxury version even had cobbles. So how did they make them so straight? Well, Marcus may have had to be handy with one of these strange contraptions, a groma. All you have to do is sight yourself on that plumb line, yeah. go through the central plumb line, yeah. and lock onto that plumb line. Oh, yeah, and then, and then you, you stick your stick in over there somewhere. You just tell me where to go, Tony. OK, let's have a go. So if I stop here, Tony, for the first stick, yeah. you tell me left or right. Uh, uh, right. Just slightly that way. Yep, bang on. There's the first one. Yeah. Then I go a little bit further. Yeah. Well, kid, nat, a gnat's knee that way. Oh, too far. That was an elephant's knee. Just a tiny bit right. Whoa, that's straight as a die. There we are, a Roman road. Yeah. How long do you reckon it would take to build a bit of Roman road from here to those trees over there? That's about 100 metres, I would think. To build 100 metres, probably 40 man hours. So if you had 40 men, 40 legionaries, then it would take one hour. That's staggering, isn't I know. it? Is it fair to say that the soldiers in the Roman army were half fighting men uh, and half builders? Absolutely spot on. So if you look at the typical Roman legion of 5,500 men, you would have maybe 4,500 as the full fat legionaries with his shield, his helmet, his javelins, his gladius, his spaniensis sword. But this legionary was also a fully trained engineer. So he didn't just carry that kit, he always carried his engineering kit as well. And then within the legion, the other thousand were also specialists. So you had uh, stonemasons, you had carpenters, you had surveyor. I joined the army for the killing, not the building. Yeah, stuff this for a game of soldiers. Marcus's unit was on its way to Hadrian's Wall, which had been built over 50 years before to protect Roman Britain from the tribes of Caledonians and Picts. His destination? Some drafty fort facing sleet and snow. We've got a remarkably vivid idea of what life would have been like for someone like Marcus from some fantastic archaeological finds that were found at a place called Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall. These are copies, they're letters and they're written on wood rather than parchment because parchment would have been very hard to come by. And they've got in them some lovely details, like there's a request for more beer and there's another request for warmer underpants, which I can quite understand. <laughs> and there's one which describes the local people as Little Britons, which I suppose is meant to be derogatory, although, quite honestly, I'm quite proud of being a Little Briton. Marcus also had a reputation for being a bit of a buffoon which probably kept his mates entertained in the long winter nights. <laughs> but one day in 208 AD, there was a surprising sight. The Roman Emperor turned up. This is him, Septimius Severus, the 21st to rule since the Empire was first founded in 27 BC, and who also happened to be the first African Roman Emperor. Severus was a hard man who turned the empire into a military monarchy. When Marcus met him, the emperor's mind was on the war in the north. Severus wanted to sort out the problem of the troublesome Scots once and for all, but he needed to boost his defences first, and that meant that Marcus and his comrades would need to rebuild the forts all the way along the wall. Another massive, back-breaking job. It was all go in the Roman army. Despite their practical approach to life, Romans were extremely superstitious. Before launching an attack, Emperor Severus wanted to know what the future held. 
This could be done by reading patterns in nature, like the way birds flocked, or in lightning, or even in the entrails of sacrificed chickens. One day, the emperor was inspecting Marcus's fort, and being a Roman, he was really superstitious, so he was looking round for some kind of sign or omen which would guide him to victory. And it was at that point that Marcus stepped into the history books. This history book, to be precise, Roman historian Augusta described an incident involving the emperor and an African soldier. And he had got this wreath of cypress leaves. And he said, Emperor, you are a god. Mind you, for a human being to be a god, you have to die first. So, uh, sorry about that. And as you can imagine, there was absolute silence. And the emperor was not amused and sent the man out of his sight. We don't know what happened to Marcus after his ill-timed joke. He would have been lucky to get away with his life. As for Severus, he died in York in 211 AD. At which point, the Romans suddenly lost interest in Scotland. But Severus had left one legacy which Marcus may just have benefited from. Before Severus died, he changed the law so that soldiers could marry local girls. And when they retired, they either got a little pension or a piece of land. So I like to think that provided Marcus wasn't executed for impertinence or killed fighting the Scots, he would have married the local girl and settled down. And maybe to this very day, his descendants are still living somewhere just outside Carlisle. At the other end of Roman Britain, it started as a small trading post on the Thames, London. Londinium was its original name. That was a Roman town. London. Oh. These were the original Londoners. Nice cup of Rosy Lee. Roman London grew fast and soon became a vital trading hub for the empire. Around about the year AD 90, a young girl called Fortunata made this journey up the Thames, but she wasn't selling anything. It was herself that was on sale. Fortunata was a slave. This could be her. Fortunata means lucky, which sounds like a cruel joke. She may have been either captured by the Romans or sold to them by her parents. She was from Gaul, modern-day France, which to her must now have seemed very far away. Roman London was crammed with a population of around 60,000. The riverside would have been bustling and noisy with languages being spoken from all over the Roman Empire. A pound of your finest Sistine Chapels, please. But there wouldn't have been any time for sightseeing for Fortunata. She'd have been shoved down the street, probably stumbling from the weight of the manacles on her hands and her feet. And she must have feared the worst. Fortunata was on her way to be sold. Today, we might associate slavery with the trade in African people taken by force to work in the Americas. But humans have been enslaving each other for thousands of years, and the Roman Empire was no different. It depended on slaves, who made up about 20% of the population. Romans were happy to make anyone a slave, whether they came from Africa, Asia, or Europe. Slaves didn't only do tough physical jobs either. They could be accountants, actors, scribes, or financiers dealing with huge amounts of money. But their individual lives are shrouded in mystery. So how did we find out about Fortunata? Did we just make her up? No, we didn't. It was a great piece of archaeological detective work. During modern excavations near the Thames, one sharp-eyed archaeologist spotted this. 
a wax writing tablet. Except, unfortunately, the wax had disappeared. Originally, it would have looked something like this. This is a tablet that a scribe would have used in Roman times to write on. You see it's made of wood and this black inside is black wax. And the scribe would write Fort Tune Nata into the wax and that was the message. If the wax didn't survive, neither would the message. Except, fortunately for us, there was one particular scribe who was very heavy-handed. How do we know? Well, examination of the wooden frame revealed the imprint of his stylus, enhanced in this replica. He pushed so hard that he gouged into the wood all the words that he was writing. So you can actually read them today. And they reveal that this is the bill of sale of the slave girl Fortunata to a chap called Vegetus, who was a slave of another slave. It says, Vegetus, assistant slave of Montanus, who was also the slave of the August Emperor, has bought and received the girl Fortunata for 600 denarii, which is quite a lot of money at that time. And uh, she's in good health and she won't wander or run away. The sale would have been a humiliating process, which probably involved Fortunata being stripped for inspection by Vegetus. Her price was equivalent to two years' salary for a Roman legionary, suggesting a highly attractive young woman, one who probably offered special skills, such as cookery. Fortunata's owner, Vegetus, had been given this money by his owner in a sort of trust. He could use it to buy whatever he wanted, even a slave for himself, so that one day, if Vegetus earned his freedom, he could set up home and, if he chose, marry his slave girl. For now, though, Fortunata belonged to whoever owned Vegetus. So she probably went to work in some kind of high-status official residence, maybe not unlike this one. As a top-end slave, Fortunata might have been given duties looking after the lady of the house. Oh, cheer up, girl, for goodness sake. She'd have had her own quarters with the other slaves. But she wouldn't have had all the luxury of underfloor heating and tiled floors and all the things we normally associate with Roman villas. She would have lived round the back or in the next field in quarters which were pretty cramped and basic. She and the other slaves would be expected to run the place so that it was self-sufficient, including growing all of their food. And doubtless, she'd have brought some of her fancy French cooking skills with her. Caroline Nicolet is French and an expert in Roman cookery. Oh, Caroline, I can smell this from the other side of the room. Oh, it's really lovely, isn't it? Oh, thank you. Should I have a toast? Yes, please, absolutely. Um, so this is called a minuto expre coquis, which is a, a pork and apricot stew, if you like. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> We're still be talking about mouthful, it's a bit hot. <laughs> but it really is that co co combination of the sweetness of the apricots and the meatiness of the pork, gorgeous. It's very much um, like a Moroccan tagine, if you like. But what is it about this Roman stew that makes it so irresistible? It's the fish sauce that we call garum. Garum is a sauce made by fermenting fish. It's old dead fish that you lay out on the beach <laughs> for days and the cats come and wee on it. It is a smelly affair. It's mainly the guts or the heads and all that that are thrown in, left to ferment with a lot of salt in the sun, in the heat, etc. for about at least three months. So Fortunata herself wouldn't get any of it. Except if she cooks it and working in the kitchen, you might have leftovers, but you won't be served that as part of your daily meal. If Fortunata was brought here as a cook, what products would she be able to cook with? There's apricots. We can't have them fresh in Britain, so they will have to be dried, preserved in honey. What about these cucumbers? 
We don't have cucumbers, as far as we know in Britain, before the Roman conquest. Say the first century BC, mm -hmm. that's where things and fashions really begin to change. Onions here, they, they would have been originally English, wouldn't they? No, oh. <laughs> they are imported. That's really odd for us now to think about a cuisine without onions. Yeah. But as far as we know, before the Roman conquest, all types of allium are very Mediterranean. Before the Romans arrived, the Brits relied on a simple diet of meat, barley, beans and root vegetables. Fortunata, I've always thought of her as a victim, but actually, at least for some of the time, she would have been doing quite well, being surrounded by exotic food, probably having a little bit herself, maybe getting a bit of respect oh, from yeah. the fact that she cooked so well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just the fact that she is so expensive. She's a very respected slave because you are an asset to the estate. It's horrible, isn't it, to think about the lack of freedom and the gross exploitation that Fortunata and slaves like her would have suffered from. But I like to think that Fortunata might actually have lived up to her name and been lucky. After all, she was alive. It seems as though she was living in quite a comfortable place. Maybe she ended up marrying Vegetus and they had a couple of kids and they became free and were happy ever after. I hope so. When the Romans invaded Britain, they brought with them all sorts of radical new ideas, some of them even more exciting than either Rhodes or the Mediterranean diet. Like, for instance, showbiz. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the show tonight. The Romans worked hard and they played hard. Among the impressive buildings that they built, or got their slaves to build, were amphitheatres, circuses, stadiums and theatres. <laughs> Roman theatre was inspired by classical Greek plays and mainly consisted of dramas that were either tragedies or comedies. They were performed by actors wearing costumes and masks to convey character. And although we don't exactly know which plays were performed in Britain, we do at least know one place where they were performed. This is the best preserved theatre in Roman Britain at Verulamium in Hertfordshire. Back in Roman times, it would have been an entertainment hotspot <laughs> with something for all the family. <laughs> but who were the stars of Roman Britain? Well, we've got one fantastic clue which contains two intriguing names. The clue is this gorgeous terracotta piece of pottery and the names are Veracunda Ludia and Lucius Gladiator. Veracunda the actress and Lucius the gladiator. This is a replica of the original which was discovered in Leicester. The small hole allowed it to be hung as a pendant, surely a love token. What we're looking at is a showbiz couple from Roman Britain. And first, I'm going in search of Veracunda's story. Much as they enjoyed their entertainment, respectable Romans looked down on actresses like Veracunda, who almost certainly would have been a slave anyway. She would have had to be a great actor, dancer and mime artist. And if these mosaics are anything to go by, pander to the bawdy expectations of the audience. She would have been part of a troupe of travelling entertainers, performing at venues up and down Roman Britain. For them, Verulamium would have been a big tour date. This area here, where all the grass is now, rectangular space, would have been the stage. And they wouldn't just have had this one pillar. There would have been one, two, three, maybe even four. And behind them would have been some kind of cloth or curtain to act as the scenery. And over here, that's where the musicians would have played. Behind them, you've got this curve all the way around. That's where the audience sat, and they'd have had tickets. They'd have been 
lead tokens which would have been stamped on the way in. And what about Veracunda? Well, when she was waiting for the show to start, she would have been up in the preparation room, what we call the green room nowadays. This is where she would have been getting a bit worked up, wondering how tonight was going to go, hanging up her frocks and dusting off her dresses. I'm hoping that Reading University's Roman expert, Dr Matthew Nichols, can reveal a bit more of Veracunda's world. What do you think of that name, Veracunda? It does have a meaning in Latin, uh, which is, we could say something like modesty. And her name is first, it's before Lucius the Gladiator. So they seem to me to be probably a couple, I would have thought. It looks to me like something these two people cared about and thought about. If you and I were here for an evening's entertainment, and Veracunda was up on stage, what would we be likely to see? I suspect if it's a troupe that's got a Ludia in it, an actress, that we're looking at mime, which might be a series of, sort of almost farcical performances, um, caricature situations from daily life. There might be song numbers and dance numbers and so on. It could be something a bit more raunchy. <laughs> it could be something a bit more highbrow. Who would be watching it? Just the people who lived in the villas or the ordinary people and the goat herds? If you look around at the building, it's a pretty large structure. It could hold a lot of people. Looking around, I would say several thousand people. So that's probably most of the population of a town like St Albans. And we might imagine people coming in from the neighbourhood as well, from the surrounding villas and farms. So I suspect you'd want to appeal to the villa crowd and to the goat herd crowd. Whatever their demographic, Romans liked an exciting end to the evening. And if the playwrights struggled to deliver a suitable climax, they could always resort to one time-honoured, if not terribly subtle, device. Sometimes a magic figure would just come in and wave a magic wand, everyone would die, end of play. <laughs> this sort of ending was known in Latin as a deus ex machina, or God from the machine. But no one was really harmed, of course. It was just pretend. Veracunda could just go back to her tent and do exactly the same thing the next day. For her boyfriend, though, the action was all too real. Ruthless bloodlust was a cherished Roman value. And one they exported around the empire to colonies such as Britain. This was the world of Veracunda's boyfriend, Lucius. Lucius was a gladiator. Britain may have been a far-flung province, but the Romans here had to have their games. They were very serious about their entertainment. You could say, deadly serious. Britain had its own modest versions of Rome's theatre of death. Today, they've either been turned into shady glades or attractive traffic islands. But don't be fooled, the games were just as nasty. They were put on for free by wealthy politicians or businessmen wanting to curry favour with the locals. Men and even women would often fight to the death in front of the baying crowds. I'll have you, lad. Come on, if you think you're hard enough. Ooh. During Lucius's time in the second century, defeated gladiators weren't always executed, but very few lasted more than 10 fights. It's hard to imagine anything more awful, isn't it? But the games were extremely popular, both with the Romans and with the Romano-British. So how did Lucius end up with a career as a gladiator? Well, we can be fairly certain that this wasn't his preferred career choice. Lucius was most likely an enemy combatant, captured from one of the British tribes and then offered a choice to either A, be executed... Um, I don't really like that one. ..or B, be enslaved and fight as a gladiator. <laughs> Lucius's life was all about survival, and fighting for a living, and being prepared to kill, and the centre of his world would have been his training, into which I'm about to get a crash course. First, I suppose I'd best get myself kitted out. 
This is quite bizarre, this. It's like a Roman car boot sale, isn't it? Very much so. A gladiator car boot sale, maybe. John Conyard is a professional reenactor. It looks like all this stuff is designed to make it difficult to fight in. There's a whole variety of different kinds of headgear here. All the helmets are made of a copper alloy, sometimes yeah. covered in tin. It's quite a weight on the head, I have to say. The fight certainly won't last very long. Certainly in some of the helmets, they're deliberately got small eye holes, so it's going to be hard to breathe. I like this wonky sword. What would the function of that have been? So, with a sword like this, I can slide it over the shield, inside the collarbone to the heart. Ugh. I can place it on your breastbone, turn it around, and then slide it upwards through the bottom of your chin, up into your brain pan. <laughs> Look at this. You wouldn't want one of these up your bits and pieces, would you? The four-skewer dagger was devastating against knee or elbow joints. On the days when Lucius wasn't fighting, what would he have been doing? If he was a young gladiator, I suspect he might have been kept to barracks, almost chained up in his room or in the gladiator school. After he's had some experience and he becomes a higher status gladiator, he might be allowed into town where he could meet actresses. How often would they fight? Um, certainly once to maybe eight times a year. I thought it would have been more like football and you would have turned out once a week. They were paid uh, very large sums of money for about anything from maybe £75,000 to a quarter of a million in our terms. So fighting one or two bouts a year would be an excellent way of having a very good living in the Roman Empire. For Lucius, the secret to a good performance was not only to be handy in a scrap, but also to get into character. Each gladiator played a different role and had his own arch enemy. What with his glamorous girlfriend, Veracunda, I reckon Lucius was a pretty boy gladiator, like this chap. Known as a retiarius or a net man, he had no helmet, so he could show off his good looks. His arch enemy was the Secutor, well armed but slow. So what's Tom doing here? Oh, Tom's playing a gladiator for us. You could take off the John's son, Tom, is dressed as a Secutor. So the Retiarius would be practically unarmoured. Yeah. They're using the trident, the fishing spear. It's a very powerful weapon. I can use it two-handed. Oh, hang on, it's a demonstration. <laughs> You're well, right. Not too bad. <laughs> the net would be weighted, uh, lead weights all the way around the outside. And, of course, we could try to throw the net in such a way to I just get it. bring him down. <laughs> so you are the fisherman Yay. who has caught the fish. Yes. With a high-energy diet and a program of rigorous training every day, Lucius prepared for his next big fight. When it came to the day of the games, the whole thing would unfold a bit like a circus in a series of acts. And if it was a really classy show, then it would be accompanied by a soundtrack played by musical instruments, just like a sort of horror movie. And Lucius would watch from the wings as the old warm-up acts came on and got the audience in the mood. But I'm not really talking about a cheeky chappy in a spangly jacket. First on were the bestiarius fighters. Criminals given spears to have a sporting chance against very hungry big cats. After the ferocious hungry animals, there'd probably be a few executions just to get the audience's bloodlust up. <laughs> then it's Lucius's call. He's had a few fights before, so by now he's well known, well seasoned, and popular. And here comes the star of the show Lucius the Retiarius. And a great reaction from the crowd. The Secutor is straight in at Lucius with a chop to the head. But Lucius easily dodges out of the way. Quick, elegant movements. Lucius makes the lumbering Rex look a bit ridiculous. Oh, another swipe from Rex. That was closer. Now, Lucius has come in on his blind side and it's back of the net. The crowd is going wild. Oh, my word. Was it really this bloody? Or is that just something we see in the movies? 
Well, not far from the prim tea rooms of York, archaeologists recently discovered evidence for a huge English gladiator's graveyard. 80 bodies, nearly all men, mostly killed in horrible ways, including one whose bones showed he'd been savaged by a big cat, presumably brought to Britannia for the games. The end for Lucius too was most probably brutal and grim. We all know something about gladiators, don't we? The strange helmets and the weird weapons and the nets. In fact, they're so bizarre, they're almost reduced to oddities, aren't they, rather than human beings? And it's only when we learn the name of one of them or see their butchered skeletons that we realise that they were people just like us, with lives like ours, but with terrible, brutal deaths. In Roman Britain, locals who became part of Roman society often did so as slaves, whether they were cooks, actresses, or gladiators. But how about the Brits who didn't get taken into slavery? What were their lives like? And are there even any records of them? Well, we do have a name, and it comes from the village of Prick Willow on the island of Eels, which is now Ely in Cambridgeshire. And that name is Bodoraginus, which roughly translates as born of victory. But whose victory? Well, it could well be Queen Boudicca, who was the tribe chief who smashed the Romans on a number of occasions. So calling your child born of victory could well be two fingers up to the Roman Empire. Cheeky little Britain. <laughs> So did Bodjuaganus live up to his name? Well, not exactly. However, he did find a way of dealing with the Romans on his own terms. You see, Bodjuaganus had a job which gave him special value. It was one which would have made the other members of the tribe look at him with a bit of awe, a bit of wonder. He was someone who seemed to have something to do with magic because he could conjure beautiful things out of the earth. He was a metal worker. This might be Bodjuaganus hard at work. After training under a mentor, he'd have become a traveling artisan or had a shop in the village. But Bodjuaganus soon became an artist of the highest caliber. We know about him because one of his products, made in the second century AD, was unearthed in a bog near the village of Prickwillow. And it's kept in pride of place at the British Museum. This is stunning. This strange looking thing looks like a little saucepan to me. What's so lovely about it is these exquisite patterns on it. Dolphins playing, sea beasts with scaly tails, and what looks like a cupid popping up in the middle of it all. It's just beautiful. Richard, help me out. What am I looking at? <laughs> yeah, well, Dr. Richard Hobbs is Western right. curator of Roman Britain. In some ways, the most important bit is the inscription that you can just see here. Yeah, is that a B there? Bodoganus, and then a dot, and then the letter F. Do you oh, know F, that? yeah, yeah, I know what that is. It's uh, like, uh, like fabricated, uh, yeah. made. Yeah, we know the name of the craftsman who made this extraordinary thing. Can I feel it? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's got a bit of heft to it, It does, it? it's quite so a... what is it actually made out of? It's made out of copper alloy, so it's made of, it's made of copper alloyed with other things. Now, we, we certainly know there's tin here. That's why it's got this greyish look to the inner part of the bowl. And there are some tiny traces of enamel, which is like a type of glass. The metal alloys would first have been cast in clay moulds, then the detail refined by delicate filing and engraving with tiny tools. Bodoaganus is clearly a very skilled and experienced man, isn't he? Yeah, he's really working at the top of his profession. He also knows a lot about Roman 
classical imagery. So he's clearly learnt the kind of artistic side of it as well as the skills needed to make this. And Bodioganus used his knowledge to create something Romans would have used in sacred religious rites. So this would have been commissioned by a priest who would have paid a lot, something like a month's salary for the average Roman legionary. Do we know anything about the, the kind of ceremony that this would have been involved in? The decoration is all about Bacchus. Bacchus is the god of wine. But he's also associated with, with rebirth, you know, the coming of the seasons, the good things in life. Bacchus was a very important god to the Romans, and they held frequent festivals in his honour. In a sacred ceremony, Bodioganus's skillet would have been used to offer wine as a sort of sacrifice to the god Bacchus. We can imagine that this is being used as part of one of those uh, festivals, the Bacchanalia, which is all about um, the merrymaking of surrounding Bacchus, the drinking of the wine, maybe the grape harvest itself. Once those ceremonies have been gone through, then you can then you can let all, all partake freely in the, in the Bacchanalian festivals themselves. So although this wine is sacramental and it's been blessed, yeah. you'd be able to neck it as part of the party. Absolutely, you, you paid your due to the god, so you can then be satisfied that you're in harmony with the gods. A Bacchanalia was basically an excuse to have a good time. And for some reason, this Roman god became very popular with many Brits. That's a bit chilly. Are you sure you should be going topless? What about you? Oh, yeah. I got a bit carried away, didn't I? <laughs> Do you think he would have been a respected member of his society? Well, the funny thing is, um, a lot of metal workers were not viewed in that way. They were kind of viewed with suspicion. Um, because of this amazing ability to, you know, bring together something from the earth with, with, with water and fire and make these extraordinary objects. So they were a bit magic. They were yeah. sort of seen as alchemists. Great at last to find evidence for how Brits could exploit the Romans. All brought together into one magnificent little saucepan by a craftsman called Bodroganus nearly 2,000 years ago. The Romans provoked such a mixture of emotions. Whatever the benefits of the Roman Empire, I can imagine many little Britons breathing a sigh of relief when the whole thing finally went down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> 